Now, the message, the twilight visions relating to outpouring and restoration. Now, we will reveal about five or six visions or more tonight. So listen real closely and relax. Now, twilight visions. Some were given in 1600. Some of the visions uh, that came or were later on. And twilight is like subdued light. It's right after sunset uh, and just before sunrise. So some of it in the early portion of the revival was given and some to take place now only at the twilight, the sunset uh, end of the age. And we'll get into the message because that in itself is a great message. It's Revelation 2, 28 and 29. And I will give him the morning star. Amen. Later you'll see a picture of a light that appeared just like the morning star. It evidently has more than one significance. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now we're going to relate what is to take place at the end of the age. Uh, and I feel that it will. And you listen real close so that you can relate it to somebody else. Uh, now remember, this is about the outpouring and how that the Lord will gather his children. And I would like at the end of the broadcast, I do have a five-minute broadcast that I went in my ministry and another ministry. We'll try to get to it. It has pictures also. But if we don't, we'll have to bring it all in this one broadcast here. So listen real close. Now, a long time ago, in 1866, in uh, Michael Baxter's book of signs or wonders that were to take place, most of Bible prophecy, now that was 1866, uh, it has this to say concerning the reappearance of the supernatural that was to come to the church. Increase faith to work miracles. 1800 will come. And unparalleled boldness in preaching the gospel. We see it. Will characterize the coming Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit. The various gifts of the Spirit were bestowed upon pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the gathering and completing of the perfect church. Now the church will come together on the power of the apostles, the prophet, the evangelist, the miracle worker, and God gets the power with the Word of God. But this end, uh, see, perfecting the church at the very end of the age with the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and so forth, and all of the revelation and power. But this end is not yet attained, but it will be at the closing end of time. Then we have here a brother remarked to Sw Smith Wigglesworth. Most of you know him way, way, way back there. And because we're going back way again, and then we're coming on to the end of the age. One is tempted to envy you when you have had such great success. And he received the following reply. Young man, it is the other way around. I feel like envying you. I've had three visions. And many people were healed in his ministry, but he wasn't given to too many visions, but he had three. The first two have already come to pass, but the third is yet to be fulfilled. I will most likely pass on to my reward. But you are a young man and will most likely uh, be here and see what I saw. And he burst uh, out. Oh, it was amazing, he said. And he was asked, what was amazing? Oh, he said, I cannot tell all of God's secrets. And somebody said, did he really see something? Sure, he wouldn't have believed him. He wouldn't have believed what he saw. Some dead living again. Creation miracles. Uh, the power to restore uh, what's been gone, cancers and tumors. But he did tell him this much, and he says, what was amazing, but you remember what I say. This revi revival that we have had is nothing, and it was a good one. But he says this, to what God is yet going to do will be on this. The one to whom Brother Smith Wigglesworth addressed these words to commented, it was quite evident that the evangelist had uh, a special vision granted to him from the, of the Lord for the coming outpouring of the Spirit and unprecedented effusion in the days just before our Lord comes to snatch away the church. Uh, you know, in preaching this message, uh, one of the things that I decided to go ahead and do this is kind of uneasiness all over the land this week. You, can, you kind of feel it, you see. Sometimes it's that's when the Lord brings things to show His people that more than showers of blessings are coming. Amen? It all runs together there. Now, Dr. Charles S. Price. A noted evangelist said in a sermon he preached shortly before his death, Yesterday we sang of showers of blessings, but now we are waiting for the deluge. It is coming, and nothing can stop it. Like every previous outpouring, this glorious experience which is about to burst upon the world uh, will not be the product of any established system. That was way back in the days before they grew so large, an organization system and the established system, but it won't be from there. 
Uh, established systems may experience it and enjoy it some, flow along in the clear stream of its beautiful outward flowing. And even then, uh, they may not do it as a system, but only as the multiplied thousand within their borders are hungry for God and come out under it. Isn't that wonderful? See, some of them will enjoy it, but mostly it's to the individual and not to the systems. The individual that God is calling by the Holy Spirit, and it says here, who are hungry for spiritual things. Now, there is more to follow. And we find here in Isaiah 43, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, and rivers are in the desert where they look like no revival could come at all. I, I will give you a revival. Isn't that great? Then he says this here, You have thought that you have, have you not thought that you have seen great glorious healing services? And he says this here, but he said, glorious healing services, perhaps you have, and for them we praise the Lord, but wait a little while. I declare unto you that God is going to do better in our tomorrows than he has ever done in our past. Uh, and you think you've seen healing revivals, and many miracles were taking place, and several different ministries. Now, these men had power with God, but what they were experiencing, and also in the later revivals, was just part of what the Lord is going to do for his children since the 1900s. Some of this way before that, 1600. Now, found in the papers, and I wrote uh, most of this on a scroll, found in the papers re relating to what he saw, uh, found in the papers of Charles Price was uh, about a prophecy concerning a temple. And it was at the end of time, and it was in the wilderness. And they do not know how he had this prophecy, but it was confirmed authentic the anointing, and so forth. But revealed to him towards the end of the age, or given to him, and some had the marking as 1600 and something on it, would be at the very end of the age uh, a church, a type of surrounding, a very potent, a very powerful ministry, one uh, of a prophetical office, with great uh, uh, extreme power in the Holy Spirit. And then, too, the anointing was kingly and powerful, and it would like heaven had opened up the ark for it. It would be in God's last deluge of power, and it would shake everything around it. It is coming to a most prophetical generation. Now, Jesus said that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and it will be the elect of God, but it was to be in the wilderness, a most powerful and breaking forth from it, would be going everywhere, the Word of God. Now we know, and we can see a while ago, he said, I will give rivers in the desert and streams of water in the wilderness. Amen. He's going to have a great revival that will go everywhere. Then I would like to come more or less closer to our time that we live in now, in the time and the period that we live in. And you listen real close. And uh, we'll see if we can get it about right. I didn't have too much time on this. And this fact, this was kind of all coming at one time to do this. And I think and believe many times in my ministry, he knows that night who's going to be there. He knows exactly. And tonight will be the lowest Wednesday night I've seen in months. He knows exactly what he is doing. How many of you know it? I couldn't foretell that at all. But he knows that. He only wants certain ones to really feel the closeness and power. He is really calling the people. Did you know it? Then maybe possibly after this you'll understand the ministry better before the deluge of power that comes from the Lord. It won't last long on this earth, but he's got great things to do. So we find out. Now we'd like to take a moment here and get deeper in the ministry. One of the places here it says in Joel 2.23, For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain in the latter month, in the first month of the first part, of the 30 or 40 years or whatever he wants to do will come down. Now, we've had some of it, but he promised some more. And right below this, he said there'd be an outpouring on the sons and the daughters of men, and it'd be such a great deluge from God. And I'm going back in a ministry that broke forth about 1946 with Angel. And I didn't know very much about it at first at all. And the ministry came, and he had had a great ministry, one of the first. He was the leader that went forth with the gifts of power once again. And uh, he told the Lord, he said, if any time in my meetings there's a failing in the offerings that I cannot continue, I'll go off the field. And he made that uh, promise to the Lord. 
Well, sure enough, about seven or eight years later, and he had some of the greatest meetings I would imagine anybody's ever had in the United States or overseas. And uh, it, he began to see the mail kind of fell off, people writing for requests, so forth like that. And some other things began to happen, and uh, he couldn't quite put his finger on it. Then he had a meeting under a, a large union meeting, many ministers. And I think he went in debt about $15,000, and all oh, that hurt him. And, but yet, he didn't want to stay up all night for pulling for money or for hours and hours doing that. So he decided in his heart he'd stick true to what he told God. And he told the Lord, he said, well, I'll just uh, go off the field, you know, and I'll just go on back and get my old job. He said, and, and he said, because I promised God. So he got home, he's off troubled about it. And he probably in his heart, he had been doing quite a bit of work, too. He had one nervous breakdown, I believe it was. And uh, this is true. The Lord told me uh, these visions are true. And uh, he got up one morning, and he was going to check into some things. And uh, he began to see, and he looked, and he saw some little children come back, little Mexican-looking children, uh, down probably around Mexico. And he seen, and he went, and he saw in it a huge arena. And uh, he only told parts of it at different times. It had to come from two different ways. And he told parts. He kept some of it out and then revealed some later. But, uh, and as he was coming there... He ran into a brother that he knew, and he said, Now we've got a way for you to get in and out of the auditorium and so forth like this, brother. Brother William Branham. And he said, uh, and he looked, and somebody said, Who's talking up there? And they looked, and the fellow was talking, had dismissed the meeting. And he said, My, he said, he's telling them all to go home. And uh, so, uh, now this is kind of condensed down from when uh, we first started in the very beginning of going off the field. But it'll be point to point. And he said, I wonder what, what's happening here. And then pretty soon he he was standing there, and the brother said, Well, he said, why did you dismiss the meeting? Well, he said, we'd already got the offering. He said, uh, and said, uh, we just let the people go. But he said, Brother, he said, I'm, I'm supposed to speak. Well, he said, you got all afternoon to speak. He said, there won't be a half a dozen people out there. Well, he said, uh, you've got all day. And about that time, he wondered about that. He told him, he said, well, when do you put the offering ahead of the message? That's biblical, too, you know. And, uh, but you should, and people do give in offerings, and I do too. You've got to have it to operate, but you have to do it in the right way. But anyway, he turned, and the angel Lord was kindly and stern stepped out and said, uh, Do you not remember our Lord? Uh, it said, When he told them the truth, they all departed from him, only the twelve. And later they scattered. Remember that? Only the twelve. All right. He told them the truth. Now, here's what was beginning to happen to him. As he began to tell them more about the Word of God uh, with his healing ministry, more and more began to fall away. His needs weren't being met. And then he said, but this fellow done it in the wrong way. He just released him and took the offering. But you, because it didn't come in, you decided to quit too. But Jesus stayed there even when there was only 12. How many of you know that? It's kind of a two-way deal there. One had done it one way and he had done it the other way. Put what? Offering before his ministry. So you're supposed to continue on until God stops you, amen, or tells you. All right, nevertheless about that, kindly good man, really humble, good man too, supposed to be. And uh, so he went on, and there's some more to it. He went back later, and he told him what he had seen. He had a tremendous meeting down there, a tremendous one, because the first one was canceled just like he was shown. I better get along with this, the Lord's telling me. And then uh, he was taken from there, and he went a little higher. And he had a little rope in his hand, a little string, and he had a little baby shoe, symbolic of Pentecostal babies. And he was trying to get it in the string. What he had was too big for them to swallow. But he's going to force it in them anyway. Well, you can't force it down. You found out later. He's trying to force it. And, it. and then the angel again talked to him. And he said, leave him alone. You can't teach Pentecostal babies supernatural things. See, the hour is not yet for it. Amen. For a lot of the things you're speaking, you're just forerunning. You're speaking them, but you're telling them of what will come. Forerunning a, a powerful thing that will get the bride together and translate. But he looked at the other end, and he could have turned it around, and it would have went in. See? It was a little island on the end. And then from there, he was taken again. It's multiple visions. And he was carried up to a great uh, lake of water that was around. And all these people were fishing, fishermen, look around there. And uh, he looked out there, and it was a great, huge uh,